you'll look in your bulletin and you'll notice that the, the sermon title is The Tithes That Bind. Came up with that title between, oh, 15 and 20 years ago. And I was so excited about my own experience when it came to tithes and offerings that I wanted to write a book. And so I set out to write a book. And then while I was writing that, I came up with, well, I started reading another book that had nothing to do with tithes and offerings. And I was so discouraged because that book was written so well that I gave up on writing the book. And so I've never written the book. I mean, I have about 40 pages or so, but it's gone through an entire rewrite. And um, so I've never used this title, but I, I thought it was very, very clever. In college is where I really started to learn about tithes and offerings. It was because that's where I really started making my own money. And it was a bit of a struggle because, you know, there wasn't much there. So how does, you know, how does this whole thing work? My family had just started coming back to church. I was learning a lot. And this is one of those things. But, you know, God in his word, he challenges us on this topic. And we'll cover that scripture in a little bit. And what it did is it offered me the opportunity eventually because I started trusting God with my money that I was able to witness to my boss. She was a lady, I don't know, she's probably close to my mom's age, so I I call her my aunt. She's like an aunt to me. Her name is Victoria. And one day we were going to lunch, and she asked me to tell her about tithing. And I was so excited. Because I thought, you know, in my naivety, you know, everybody who's a Christian would do that. But she hadn't gotten there in her Christian experience yet. And we talked about it, and she started implementing it in her own home. And months later, she came back to me and she said, you know, I'm so glad that I made that decision because God is so faithful. And so that that was a blessing to me. So, someone once said, there are three kinds of givers. Flint, the sponge, and the honeycomb. Now, to get anything out of a flint, you know what you have to do? You gotta strike it, right? You gotta hammer it. And then you know what you get? Chips and sparks. Then there's the sponge, right? To get anything out of a sponge, you got to really squeeze it. You got to use more and more pressure before you really get what you want, right? And then there's the honeycomb. And the honeycomb is unlike the others because it just overflows with sweetness. And the question I have for you this morning is, what kind of giver are you? Are you more like the flint Are you more like the sponge or are you more like the honeycomb? I have to laugh a little bit because I once did a sermon at another church where I spoke on tithe and I spoke for an hour and a half that morning. I had a lot of material that I wanted to cover. Don't worry, that's not going to happen this morning. But there were two little ladies who were visitors And as I was shaking people's hands after the service, they only had one question for me. And that was, are you the pastor here? (laughs) I didn't know I had gone that long. To me, it seemed as time had just passed. What is tithe? Well, tithe comes from a Hebrew word, which I'm not going to pronounce for you. Um, But it simply means a tenth. And we, re- we see this reflected in the scriptures. In Leviticus 27, 32, it says, And concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock, or whatever passes under the rod, well, the tenth shall be holy to the Lord. We also see that in Genesis 14, 20, is the first time that we see the word tithe used in the Bible. This is when Abraham is giving to Melchizedek, the, the priest king of Salem. Abraham here has recognized God's blessings on his life, 
And so he decides that he is going to return a tenth to God's representative. Not entirely what, unlike what we do today. This is something that God's people continued to do throughout the Old Testament. It was introduced into their entire economy, you could say. It's important that we understand tithe in a proper context. You see, tithe is not a God tax. Because the Bible tells us that God doesn't really need it anyway. Right? Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those that dwell therein. You can't outgive the one who owns everything. Haggai 2.8 says, The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And giving to God in a very small way, in a comparison, is like trying to give that gift to that relative who has everything, right? You've all been there before. What do you give the person who has everything? It can be a struggle. You're scratching your head, you're fretting over it, sometimes 12 months out of the year. You just don't know what to do, right? What do you give somebody who has everything? Well, there's one thing that God automatically does not have. Your heart. And so God steps out in faith, and he provides this environment, if you will. An environment that you can, you have the opportunity, you have the chance to recognize where all your blessings come from. God provides that environment. And he hopes that you will realize in that environment, wow, God is an amazing giver. Deuteronomy 8.18 tells us, and you shall remember the Lord your God. That's an admonition right there. For it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. God wants us to remember him. It seems like that is oftentimes a common theme in the Bible. God wants us to remember him. He must know that as human beings, we are so prone to forget. And you can only remember someone you have a relationship with, right? A connection, a tie, if you will. One of the largest most explicit portions of scripture that talk about tithe and offerings is found in Malachi chapters uh, 3 verses 8 through 11. And this is where we expand our conversation not just to talk about tithe but offering. And it starts with God asking Israel a question. He says, will a man rob God? Boy, can you imagine being asked that question by God? I mean, that would make you squirm sitting before the Almighty. Are, Are you robbing me? Right? I mean, that's a serious accusation. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? And God says, in tithes and offerings. I used to read this and just sit and think, how do you rob God of an offering? I mean, it's free will, right? You, you don't, if you don't have that offering or you don't, you don't, I mean, what, what, do you, what do you do? How are you robbing God? I mean, yes, you have something, but he, he doesn't necessarily say, you, you have to give me an offering and this is how much. Well, I, I realized through reading the Bible, there's all kinds of ways that you can actually rob God of an offering. And we're going to look at one this morning, just briefly. If you go in your Bibles, you can find this in Acts chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 1 through 11. Here it says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession and kept back part of that price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. They were giving an offering. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the land? They had purposed in their heart. They had made a promise, a vow, if you will, to God. I am going to give this money 
to God. It is set apart. This is the amount. This is the plan. This is what we're going to do when we sell the land. And it is consecrated for his service. But then, you know, maybe they didn't expect the land to sell for so much. And then, yeah, well, I mean, do we really need to get all of it? I mean, we thought it would only sell for this much and we got so much more. You know, if we just gave this same amount that we thought, maybe that would work. The amount that we thought we were going to get. Well, it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own power? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came upon all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered to her, what an opportunity this lady had. Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yea, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold the feet of them which have buried your husband are at the door and shall carry you out. Just about gives me chills reading that. Then she fell down immediately at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband and great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. I would think that would uh, cause people to think twice. This is one way that somebody in the Bible decided to rob God of an offering. They didn't have to give it. They didn't have to purpose in their heart to give so much or a percentage or whatever the amount is. We're not told. But they purposed in their heart that that's what they would do. And they went back on it. Right? They robbed God of that offering. We'll pick back up in Malachi chapter 3, starting with verse 9. It says, You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. That's a pretty big problem. I don't think I would want to hear God telling me, You are cursed with a curse. Their whole society, think about it, they're an agrarian society, farming community, right? Their whole society depends upon the blessing of God. Depends upon it. Their entire livelihood is wrapped up in this concept. Their whole economy functions because of God's blessing. For that to be cursed, it would ruin them. All right? So as is God's way, he gives the remedy. He says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be found food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. How many of you have experienced that overflowing blessing as you are faithful to God? That's a few amens. I would think I would hear a lot more. But you know, when you have God's favor and you do what God asks, he covers all the bases. Not only does he provide the blessing, he provides the protection for that blessing. And so it continues. It says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of the ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for your field, says the Lord of hosts. The New Testament is not silent on tithe. Here we see a passage from Matthew 23, 23. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. Jesus says these you ought to have done without leaving the other undone. 
It's interesting what the passage does not say because it's a perfect opportunity for Jesus to say, well, don't bother paying tithe. I mean, that's going away anyway. You don't need to do that. But he didn't say that. In fact, he enforced it, reinforced it. He says, no, pay your tithe, but also don't neglect the more weighty matters of the law. We also, you can jot this down for your notes. You can read about tithe in Hebrews chapter seven. Tithe is not the focus of that um, portion of scripture. Rather, the focus is on the better priesthood of Christ in comparison to the Levitical priesthood. But again, we see no evidence in this section that tithing would cease. We also have some references which do not indicate necessarily an amount, but that we have a duty in stewardship. So in Luke chapter 20, verses 22 through 25, somebody comes with a question. Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or no? Oh boy, you gotta pay your taxes, right? Death and taxes, the surety in life. But he perceived their craftiness because Jesus was a wise man. And he said unto them, why tempt ye me? Show me a penny. Whose image and superscription has it? And they answered and said, it's Caesar's, right? And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. Jesus recognized there are things of our money, of our abundance, of the blessing that he has given us that belong to God. We have a duty in stewardship. 1 Corinthians 9, 13, and 14 is a very strong reference. It says, Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. Where does this idea come from? Well, it comes from a couple of places. Deuteronomy 18, 1 says, The priests are the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. So the Levites did not get their own portion of land like the rest of their brethren in Israel. They did get some cities scattered throughout Israel, but they didn't have a, a portion of land where they could say, this is our own land. But they were, they did have a provision because the Lord said, you are to be in my service. This is your duty, this is your job, this is your sole function is to minister and so that you have the capacity to do that full time, Israel, the rest of Israel collectively will give a tenth and they will bring it to the Levites. And that's how they would be sustained. But all the tithes of the children of Israel, this is from Numbers 18, 24, which they have offered as an heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore, I have said to them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance they were to receive of the tithe. Leviticus 27.30 says that tithe is holy and all the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. It is set apart, right, for God's work. It is designed to minister. That's what the tithe is for. Where does the tithe go? We find that time to time, people have misconceptions about tithes and offerings. We'll talk a little bit about that in a practical sense in our own church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. From week to week, you may earn a wage, you may come here or online, and you will give your tithe, depending on when your pay schedule hits. And you give that through the local church. And from the local church, the tithe, 100% of it, all the tithe, goes to the local conference. Not one red cent stays here. And then from there, there's a portion of funds that go to the union, a portion of funds that go to the division, and a portion of funds that go to the general conference. So here's a little bit more of a breakdown. I'm sorry, I could not adjust the numbers on the screen, so I will read them to you. So like I said, 100% of tithe money that the local church takes in 
Not, not, not a single penny stays here. All the tithe goes on to the local conference. From there, the local conference gives 9% to the union, in this case, the Southern Union. And then they give 15.5% to the North American Division. Okay? The NAD takes that 15% it receives from each union, and then it sends 6.6% to the General Conference. What is it used for? <clears throat> well, there are several categories. Primarily, it's used for ministerial capacity, as we see in the Bible example. Um, it is used to um, pay the salaries of pastors and evangelists, uh, Bible workers. Sometimes uh, Bible workers will only receive benefits from tithe. Um, it's used for administration. So for example, conference officers, departmental directors, accountants, clerks, office secretaries. The tithe is also used for expen expenses related to things like evangelism, the conference office operations, conference office and evangelistic equipment. It can be used for campgrounds, for camp meeting operations. And then there's another category, which is evangelistic outreach and nurturing. Not entirely all money for each, each category that's listed here can be used for tithe. So for example, when you see elementary uh, school principals and teachers, they can only receive up to 30% of the tithe to pay their salary. The rest of the money has to come from other funds. So, and then they, you can see on down the line, there are colleges, universities, Bible departments, presidents, dean of students, residence hall deans, literature evangelists, conference centers, youth camp operating expenses, media programs, so things that we print as a church, radio, TV, although I will say I have done, worked briefly at It Is Written, and they do not receive a majority of their funds from this. The majority of the funds that they use to operate are from giving people like yourself they probably only receive about 1% of their entire budget from the church. And then we have retirees, people who have ministered for a period of time and they have retired from their occupation and part of it is used to help sustain them as they live out their retirement years. There are three offering plans that are recognized by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. One is the calendar of offerings. This is a schedule, and this is primarily used by the North American Division. We see this at this church every single week. The local conference has a schedule, the NAD has a schedule, and we follow a schedule, which means that every single week, whatever's printed in the bulletin, is what we are giving our loose offering to. So unless you mark it, it's going to that offering. So last week it was for North American Division Women's Ministries. If you put loose offering in, that's where that went. Unless you marked an envelope otherwise. And so there's a schedule. In this church, the schedule follows something that every other week we give to the local church budget. And then the rest of the year is planned out and we just follow the schedule. And different ministries or different funds are highlighted, either at the union level, the NAD, or the world church level. And we give to those the loose offering. You are not forced to follow that schedule. If you feel very passionate, for example, about your local church, you are free to give to your local church every single week. But on the weeks where the loose offering does not go to the local church, you have to mark your tithe envelope. We have to be very specific about funds. There is also another giving plan for offerings. It's recognized by the portion of the church, and this is the personal giving plan. And on this plan, what they do is they say, they suggest that you give a portion of your income uh, to different offerings. So there's suggested percentages for the local church that you would designate three to 5% of your income to the local church in addition to your tithe. 
You could also designate one to two percent for the conference advance. Well, what is that? The conference advance goes for things like Christian education, local evangelism, vacation Bible school, summer camps, union magazines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you could also suggest a donation of one to three percent to the world budget. And this is of your total income. This is what these percentages are based on. So you can see, if you quickly do the math, besides the 10% that you're giving in tithe, you could easily be giving another 10% to different facets of how the church works on various levels. There's a third option, and I recently learned that this option is actually what 90% of the World Seventh-day Adventist Church operates by this plan. It is the combined offering plan. So what they say is week by week, every offering that's given, it just goes into a pool. We're not highlighting any particular schedule. We're not highlighting any particular ministry. We're just saying everything goes in the pool that's an offering. And then what they do is they take 50%, 50 to 60% of that offering and they designate that to the local church they take another 20 to 30%, they send that off to the local conference, and then they take 20% and they send it to the general conference. And that's it. It's a very simplified giving plan. Nobody's really discussing week by week where the money goes. The offering calls, I would imagine, would be very short because every week, everybody already knows this is where the money's going. These days you have a lot of options. Many of us donate online. You can go to, um, I think it's adventistgiving.org, I think is the website. And there is an, even an app for your smartphone if you want to do it that way. You can go online, you can pay your tithe. And then when you log in for the first time, you are supposed to specify what church you belong to so they can track, you know, membership and who's, what church is giving tithe and offering and, and so forth. And then from there, you have a number of local options that you can give to your local church. You could give to the local church budget. You could give to the building fund. We like that option. You can give to all kinds of local options there. And it also has other options for, um, that are beyond the local options that you can give to. So if that's convenient for you, you can also do that. There are some misconceptions that people have about tithe and offering. I just want to talk briefly about those for a little bit. Tithe is what I give after I pay my bills. Some people, I've run into people that have this misconception. They think, okay, so I get my paycheck, I'm going to pay all my bills, and then whatever's left over, that's what I give my tithe on. According to the Bible, that would not be accurate. The Bible indicates that um, we tithe on our increase, okay? So it says in Deuteronomy 14, you shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. What's your increase? Your increase is you go to a job, you earn money, whatever money you earn from that job, that's your increase because you didn't have that prior, right? So that's your increase. And some people take a variation on that. And they will say, okay, well, you know, I will, um, after Uncle Sam takes his portion, government takes their portion, I'll tithe, I'll tithe on that. But remember, your increase is what you worked for, what you gained. And if we go back to this scripture in Luke 20, 25, and he said to them, render therefore unto Caesar the things that be Caesar's, but unto God the things that be God's. You see, tithe is an indication of who is Lord in your life right? Who deserves our first and best affections? Isn't it Jesus? I think so. We should follow this principle in our whole life, not just tithing, but this should guide our lives. And when we think about tithing, this should come to mind. It says, and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Right? In your personal giving, seek God first. He deserves the best of what we have. He deserves all of what we have. And 
our attitude in all of that should be expressed as the scriptures teach us in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7, should be done with a smile on our faces, right? When it comes to tithe and offering, I should see nothing but a sea of smiles on Sabbath morning because everybody is happy to give. It says, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Another misconception, we've already alluded to this, all the money I give stays at the local church. I think that we have seen that all, not all the money stays here. Only local funds stay here. All the tithe goes on to the conference. I can give to any ministry through the local church. Well, there are some wonderful ministries out there. We have Amazing Facts. We have It Is Written. We have Little Light Studios, right? But if you give to those ministries through your local church, well, our treasurer will likely be giving you a call and sending that check back to you, right? Especially if it's marked as tithe. And if you were to send your tithe directly to any one of those institutions, whether they are attached to the church or self-supporting, some self-supporting don't do this, but, but most I think do, they should be sending it back to you as well because they are not supposed to be accepting your tithe. That's their policy. So, um, I don't think I've run into that at Little Light. At least if they do, they're not admitting it. Some people do that. They just send you money and you don't know if it's tithe or offering under which you have no, you know, that's between them and God and you have to do the best that you have knowledge of. I can give to help any individual through the church. We want you to help individuals. But the local church has an obligation that they cannot take in funds on behalf of an individual for you and you get a tax deduction for it. It cannot go to whomever you specify. Funds that are taken in have to go to an account, a fund if you will. So as much as you may like a particular missionary, the church cannot then in turn just write a check to that missionary. So what can I do? Well, one solution is if you want to give to a particular ministry or you want to give to a particular individual, you can give it directly, right? That's probably the best way. Um, in some of those cases, you won't receive a tax deduction because an individual may not be set up that way. A ministry may not be set up that way. Some are, some are not. But you know what? That's okay. Because if God has impressed you to do it, well, God's the one who provides it all anyway, right? And I'm sure he can provide you with more. Our church you may not think that our church, after hearing this, is, is a church that would particularly need uh, a tithe and offering sermon. Our church is very blessed. About 90% of the people that give in this church pay their tithe. That is an unusually high statistic. It's an, that's high. So we are blessed. Um, in fact, per capita, we have the best um, tithing numbers of any church in the Georgia Cumberland Conference. Um, but 90% still means there's room for improvement. Amen? We should not be satisfied until we hit 100% because God is faithful and we should be faithful too. At the end of the day, stewardship is really about relationship. You don't give to somebody you don't trust. So, I don't know about you, but in my own life, I found that I can trust God with it all. I hope and pray that you have. He can do more with the 10% that you give him than you can with the 90% that you keep. 
I want to like close with a quote um, that I came across from David Livingstone. I think he put this whole concept about stewardship very well. He says, I place no value on anything that I have. As I tell my children, it's all going to burn. Maybe that's a little bit dark, but uh, it's the truth. He says, I place no value on anything I have or may possess, except in relation to the kingdom of God. If anything, I will advance the interest of the kingdom. It shall be given away or kept. Only as by giving or keeping it shall I most promote the glory of him to whom I owe all my hopes in time or eternity. I hope and pray that each one of you, if you're in that 90%, keep being faithful to God because I know he will continue to be faithful to you. And if you're in that 10%, I encourage you, take God at his word. He says in Malachi, try me now in this. God is the one making a promise. And if you can't trust the promises of God, you cannot trust anything in this world. So try God if you're not there yet. Some people are like my friend Vicki. St- they were growing. She was growing in her Christian experience. Some of you are still growing in your Christian experience. That's okay. But I encourage you to try God. And I believe as we are faithful to God, this, this dream that we have of our own building, if we are faithful to him, he will be faithful to us. And he will open up those windows of blessing. And he will provide for that building as long as it's dedicated to his service and glory.